It's a delight to be here and a pleasure to have an opportunity at Gabrielle's invitation and with all of you that helped put this great event together with a commitment to Earth, with a commitment to our true mother, and with a commitment to the future, if we have one. And that's where we find ourselves right now. And where we find ourselves, of course, is at a past a pivotal point, actually, in a, as Ronnie was sort of saying, in a rather urgent state. In a state that, that is crisis, there's no question about it. So regenerative agriculture, our farmers can be our climate heroes. And Gabriel asked me to bring that title forward. And when I was at Rodale, we started that. Uh, farmers can be our heroes, that's for sure. You might ask, I'm Californian, sixth generation actually, uh, why a French flag? And, and I said to our esteemed guest here tonight, well, I, I have French heritage one. Two is uh, the United States wouldn't exist without the French Navy uh, saving us at Yorktown. And uh, third, four per thousand. And that's where I want the conversation to go. It's actually a commitment to something that can help create a future. But I'm going to talk a little bit here about two co-joining things coming together at the same time. And that is the loss and degradation of soil while climate is creeping up on us faster than our predictions were. And scientists are often conservative in what they predict, and they were with that as well. Roland Bunch, a dear friend of mine, uh, over three decades ago, I was in Central America with him, learning about regenerative agriculture. But he made and wrote for uh, the State of the World Report that the tragedy is rushing at us so quickly that tens of millions of people could starve within the next four or five years. The continent faces an imminent tragedy. He missed it by two months. But he wasn't, he said, and it won't depend on whether it rains or not. So what's he talking about? How could he predict that as somebody that's been in development around the world and know that this was going to happen and it happened? And why are we listening to and working with him as one of our leaders? Well, how he did that was that he noticed, which we could notice, we've been farming the carbon out of our soils as we've been talking about. And because population increased and the families divided the land up, became smaller and smaller, they no longer had time to put it in fallow. So the carbon couldn't reaccumulate before you came back to farm it again. And that carbon got farmed out of it. As the carbon left, then it no longer had the ability to hold the water, let alone percolate it. And he said people would say, how is it we're having a drought and a flash flood at the same time? And this is how. The water won't percolate and it runs off. You can have a big downpour, but you don't get to save any of the water. So your drought remains. So it won't depend on rainfall. It depends on building the soils. We know that we're losing them. So we're degrading them and we're losing them. And we're losing them at a rate that's not just unsustainable, it's an end to civilization. And this is, was a field next to the, the plots I had in Africa. This to only one time, disturbed. This is Burundi, where I was doing some work with the Burundian leaders, trying to get them to think about conservation agriculture. Let's restore and save our soils. Uh, this was my neighbor in California. Um, I could show you a neighbor. I have a house in North Carolina, don't ask me why. Same, same scene. And then I put this airplane picture up here because Andre got me to work with, with uh, Doug Tompkins in, in Argentina on a 6,000 acre organic farm because he knew we had to get to a no-till situation in organics, which is typically not the case. And he wanted to get there. And he was flying me over farm after farm after farm, tipping the wings saying, look at erosion, erosion, erosion all over the world. So this is happening while we're talking about climate. And if we want to sequester it back in the soil, we've got to still have the soil to sequester it back into. These two things are coming together. So we have to aggregate the soil. And that's a biological question. So our experts here better than me. Uh, Elaine will talk later, who can talk about the biology and the cements and the glues and the air spaces and all that that have to happen. My sand in Africa, Howard Buffett said, Tim, I'm going to give you the best, worst soil you can farm. And he did. It was sand. And that center one on your right was my field. I was so surprised it aggregated in a year. No-till, 
biological focus. The field that I just showed the picture of eroding just dissolved immediately. On my home piece, this is like seven days later, I went in and finally took a picture. I had a whole group that came to my place and I had pulled them out. Well, the one on the left was my neighbor just across the street that disked twice a year. And you see it melted, nothing's left, it's at the bottom. But boy, after seven days, my soil's still holding together. Airspace, aggregated, biology's alive, it's doing its job. It's also sequestering carbon. Here is a no-till need. In Ghana, I was working with Kofi Bo on setting up some experimental plots in four different ecoregions. And this one, there's cowpeas in this front plot and cowpeas in the back plot. And what's the difference? The back plot wasn't tilled this season. That's the only difference. Just no tillage. Food security, starvation. So this is a crucial element for us to take a look at. So let's move into the climate change discussion and say, okay, 350, that's where we want to get to. No, I would say, how is that possible? Where is there any history or record that says we can survive at 350? In 400,000 years, it's always been below 300 until what us homo sapiens have done. And now it's still growing. And so what happens is, is we get not necessarily more storms, but intensified storms, more water. We are changing the environment. When I listen to agricultural scientists over the last few years, and I've listened to them from different universities say, well, you know, us here in New York, we're going to be able to grow Georgia peaches with climate change. Well, I listen to Oregonians and say, we're going to be able to grow California varietals up here in Oregon. Really? <laughs> or north of me, what happens when we see an intensification where whole urban neighborhoods are burned down? Something that's not even fathomable, but this is due to this intensification. So it, it, it is not look bright for us in so many ways when we consider where we find ourselves, except when we turn to soil, which is why you brought us here. And so I threw out most of my slides out because other speakers I know are going to be speaking about this. Andre and I, I met Andre in Copenhagen when, at the climate talks, and we were both on the same page, got to know each other. We knew what the data said. We knew the impact it could make. Nobody else was talking about it. The Europeans told us we were crazy. Well, in essence, I was dealing with where this compost line was. And I'm going to clear some of those data points out. If any of you want to know more about those data points more deeply, I'll go into those with you. And I'm going to simplify it this way to say no-till. And why no-till is so important is we just said why it's so important. You've got to have soil to be able to sequester. But it will also sequester just by no-tilling as one practice. Winter covers is going to jump and double that. If you're going to jump to multi-species, that's a whole other thing. Compost, a stabilized humate, we can go on and on about that. Managed grazing, as a study at, in Georgia, found this huge jump in building poor soils back in carbon levels. And then David Johnson, who Ronnie just mentioned, at New Mexico State, and he needs funding, I'm telling you. The chemical companies are not rushing to help him. But they can't sell fertilizer if you're just going to apply organisms and sequester carbon at those levels and get the biology to do the work at the same time. And actually, that's what's doing it. On my little piece of land, here was my cover crop. I had my neighbors saying, when are you going to knock your weeds down? <laughs> well, well, I did. What's a cheap little thing I just borrowed from my neighbor who would roll his horse uh, roping arena down. And I could just go in and knock it down and leave it there. Well, I'll tell you, I want to talk about biodiversity coming back. Grow something like the mustard is now going to seed. When that mustard was bloomed, it was a symphony of bees and pollinators out there. You can recreate the morphic field and they will come. Create the space and it will show up. But carbon, at least 1,300 kilograms per hectare is going in the ground there. In David, in applying one and a half years of this biologically enhanced inoculant into the soil, a very simple and cheap process, got this much increase in cotton. Except this year he sent me this picture. Instead of that cotton being waist high, it's head high after seven years of application of biology, building the life system and the biodiversity, the health, the healthy biome. Like we need it in our gut, we need it in the soil as well. And now 
We're starting to understand what Earth was trying to tell us all of these years. David had taken uh, Gabe Brown's data because Gabe was just a conventional farmer going broke, and he went to no-till, started to save some money, actually started to sequester some carbon. Then he started to add diversity to his farming, and he started to store a little more carbon. Then he had to cover crops and it increased more. When he did multi-species, I was on the phone to him years ago. He said, I think I'm going to plant 70 species this year. I don't think he still does that. He kept trying, kept experimenting. It started to really go up to where and you see up there when he then added livestock to come in and graze that cover crop, adding another biological component, he was sequestering 22.6 tons of carbon per hectare. But well, we don't even need all the farmland if we start doing that. We could actually fix this problem pretty rapidly. If we had enough farmers, still we'll take the majority of them, but if we had enough, we could get there. So, oh, this got messed up. But I would say, how would I change these papers? Because in 2008, we did two white papers. And this sort of started a lot of the conversation. That's where I met. Tom Newmark, we came by, and that's how the Carbon Underground started, because he said, wow, we can actually fix the whole thing. And that was back of the envelope calculations. If we take what we know at that time, we could sequester all of it. Well, now we know with David's work, et cetera, we can do a lot better than those numbers. But what I would change about both of these papers, the one got me invited to brief Vice President Gore a couple of times. The other one got me invited to work on an African panel at the UN, but I would take the word organic out for one reason. For most farmers on this continent, at least south of the border, that's fighting words. And we need them. Um, we need everybody. And we, ha we know language matters. Words matter. And we need to build those bridges. We need to reach out and work with them. And so we know if we're just going to use organic acres, in the U.S. it's less than 1%. We won't fix climate. Globally, it's 0.9%. We won't fix climate. So we've got to reach to all of those farmers in a language they understand, in a language that will help them for whatever motivates them, because it's all of us that are going to either make this or not. So one of the things that strikes me is innovation theory I was working with some people in the Punjab region of India a couple months ago. They've been studying this so well, and we're getting some projects going there to get some wheat rice farmers to make some changes and stop burning their uh, residue. But they're not dealing with the innovators because most people are not ready for those crazy innovators out there. But they will work with the early adopters. So we have to find those influencers, those ambassador farmers those people who can actually talk to other farmers and convert them. And it's going to be kinds of people like these crazy guys, Gabe Brown and Ray Archuleta, who talk farmer talk. And they're talking profit. And Gabe will always say, I want to sign the back of the check, not the front of the check. Those are the kinds of conversations. And I guarantee you, they, they won't open their dialogue with climate. Not in America, for Pete's sake doesn't exist, climate change doesn't exist, or it's too insensitive to talk about that right now. So <laughs> we have to use the language that works because we need it all to change. And this needs to go around the world. And so Roland Bunch, who I quoted earlier, looking at his work in Central America, he told me down there, he said, you know, we can build an inch of topsoil a year. And he said, no textbook says you can do that. A few years later in Africa, no, decades later in Africa, he said, Tim, you remember when I told you we'd make an inch a year? I said, oh, I do, because I've been telling everybody all over the world you can do that. He says, I was lying to you. I said, what? He said, yeah, we could do much more than that, but I knew you wouldn't believe me. So he could, and that's sequestering carbon. And we have scientists that argue against that. I was showing you Kofi Boa's experimental plots earlier. This is actually one of my plots in Africa. But when Kofi got there and we were teaching seed growers on the continent, he couldn't stand it. He just, he's a great teacher. He got involved and I said, you can go, Kofi. We're in his, he got his uh, advanced degree at Nebraska. He's Ghanaian. But I, I want to point out he's wearing a hat that says Los Sal on it. 
<laughs> and it's easy to give away clothing and apparel with your name on it when there's a university that also has yes. the same name. You know, it, it helps. Uh, but anyway, Kobe and Roland are converting thousands of farmers around the world. And they're using the right words and the right language. And they're helping them make this transition to regenerative. So regenerative is really rather simple. because, But, it, but if we want maximum carbon, I argue we have to stack practices. But it really is maximizing photosynthesis, as David Johnson would say. It is improving the efficiency of photosynthesis. And biologically, and I'm sure Elaine will talk about this, that can happen. And capturing that carbon, holding it. And that means using no-till and cover crops, maybe compost if you have a plant diversity, uh, some sort of multi-paddock grazing if you have animals. And biological, don't read how inoculation was spelled, because I was looking at a very small screen when I put that up there. Anyway, <laughs> um, get the life and boost that life in the soil at the same time. So we can do this. We can actually do it. The question I think comes up is, will we? Well, you know, years ago, when I was at uh, Savory Holistic Management, my board chair pushed me on, on Dana Meadows' work at MIT and, and limits to growth. And by God, when you look at those computer models, what have we changed since they said we've got to change the way we're doing business and living our lives? What have we changed? Not too much. And all of those computer models said we crash. We're going to crash in our electric cars, but we're going to crash still because it still isn't quite working. When you listen to Jared Diamond, he shows us civilization after civilization that cut their last tree down and disappeared. And now I've been digging into this book, Sapiens, because I'm such an optimistic guy. No. <laughs> it always causes me to think, how do we get through this? How do we figure that out? And he reminds us there were five species of humans when Homo sapiens were here. And where the Homo sapiens moved into their territory, those species disappeared. Where those same Homo sapiens moved into North America and Australia, Andre and I were talking about this earlier, the megafauna disappeared. We know species are disappearing very rapidly on this planet right now. We're eliminating them through our inattention, our lack of connection and commitment and care, or even concern. What does that say about our future with what we're doing with climate, what we're doing with soil loss, it seems that we're doing the same thing. So it brings me to the point of saying thank you for coming because you care about the planet and about soil, about humanity, and basically all the other species that are here to support life, that are part of life, that are part of us. And I really invite us to remember, of course, that you are aware that the soil is not just the dirt below, it's also the plant above, it's one whole system. And we're a product of that system, and all the life is dependent, it's essential. We cannot live without it. And so our commitments to it, Ronnie's invited some linkages, Gabrielle's invited some linkages, I'm sure other speakers will. I'd be very interested to listen to your ideas if we have a moment in the next day. I'd be very interested to listen to what you think we can do together. I've tried to help people at Chico State because I don't work there, but get this whole academic thing started so that we can start to train people through a university. So that we can maybe start a journal of regenerative agriculture that's scientists, that's science-based and peer-reviewed. So it's a, a thing, a real thing. And that we can start to educate people around the world who want more formal degrees to take it beyond. With that, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be here, and thank you for your commitment of your heart to think about how we work with Earth and with each other, every one of us. Thank you very much.